Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's student led journal club seminar. Um, my name is Anne Marie Hayes and I'm a research associate on the Joplin campus of KCU. Today, I will be introducing our speaker, student Dr. Sarah Shapiro. Student Dr. Shapiro is a second year medical student at Kansas City University at the Kansas City campus. She was raised in Topeka, Kansas, where she received a Bachelor of Science in Biology at Washburn University. After college, student Dr. Shapiro acquired a Master in Health Science in Molecular Microbiology and Immunology, and a Certificate in Tropical Medicine at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where she conducted research in the areas of malaria, vaccinology, and autoimmune diseases. See, she has since been working on clinical research projects at the University of Utah in Pediatric Photophobia, NMDA, Receptor Encephalitis, and giant cell arteritis. Presently, student Dr. Shapiro is interested in pursuing a career in autoimmune neurology and neuroimmunology. In her free time, she enjoys teaching Latin, baking, and beekeeping. So with that, the floor is yours, student Dr. Shapiro. Thank you so much. Um, so like Anne-Marie said, my name is Sarah Shapiro and I'm a second year medical student. I am here today to share with you a case study um, that I um, had during my time at the University of Utah on giant cell arteritis. So the title kind of gives it away, but the patient had giant cell arteritis of the superior mesenteric artery and presented with Wernicke encephalopathy from thiamine deficiency. So the purpose of my presentation today is that I want to use this as a learning tool for first and second year students to help prepare them for boards material. So if you guys feel comfortable, I will be asking some questions to you um, and you can feel free to put some answers in the chat. Um, I will not take it, take any offense if you don't wanna answer in person, but I wanted to share this material with you and hopefully it will help you um, when you're doing some studying. So let's get started. So this is the case presentation. A 68-year-old female with a history of primary generalized seizures presented to the clinic with a six-week history of paroxysm symptoms of acute confusion, the inability to rise from a seated position, and diplopia. So the main thing I want you to pick out are her symptoms. Confusion, the inability to rise from a seated position, and diplopia. Does anyone know what medical triad is being represented in this clinical presentation? Um, feel free to raise your hand or put it in the chat. I'll give people a couple of seconds and then I'll continue on. And if no one knows, that's okay too. This is all part of the learning process. So these three symptoms or this in this case presentation actually represents Wernicke encephalopathy. So Wernicke encephalopathy is um, based off of three key features, which is encephalopathy, ataxia, and ophthalmoplegia. So the confusion is the encephalopathy, the inability to rise from a seated position is the ataxia, and the diplopia that she was experiencing was the ophthalmoplegia. In her physical exam findings, we also see that it was quite consistent with the Wernicke encephalopathy. So she had bilateral lower extremity weakness, bilateral upper extremity dysmetria when she was doing the finger to nose testing, impaired perception of vibration and proprioception with conspicuous sparing of pain and temperature in both lower extremities. For the encephalopathy portion, she had alterations of consciousness in the absence of loss of consciousness, impaired attention span, and the ophthalmoplegia presented as global disconjugate gaze. So what I mean by that when I say global is that it affected all of her muscles in her eye. So it would affect all cranial nerves related to the movement of her eyes. She also had optic disc pallor and severe anorexia and weight loss during hospitalization. So those don't necessarily go with the Wernicke's encephalopathy um, directly, 
but it's something that we're going to keep in our back pocket um, to explain later. So as I mentioned, with Wernicke encephalopathy, it typically presents as this, but does anyone know what the mechanism of Wernicke encephalopathy is? You can put in the chat or answer in Zoom, up to you. Do you mean like a thiamine deficiency? Exactly. So the main mechanism of Wernicke encephalopathy is thiamine deficiency, so vi vitamin B1. So my next question would be like, does anyone know what a common etiology for thiamine deficiency is? There's so many, but um, does anyone know one that most people will associate? with Wernicke encephalopathy. So the one I'm thinking about is actually Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome. So individuals um, who have alcohol use disorder will actually present with Wernicke encephalopathy because alcohol actually impedes the uptake of vitamin B1 um, and thus they'll present with this encephalopathic, ataxic, and sometimes even the ophthalmoplegia um, aspects of the Wernicke encephalopathy. So now that we kind of know that we're looking at some type of um, micronutrient deficiency, we decided that we wanted to get some labs. And we decided to do a micronutrient assay which covers so many different vitamins and nutrients. I've only highlighted a few here. Um, it, this is not an extensive uh, list of all of the nutrients that we um, sampled, but obviously we're looking at probably a low vitamin B1. However, this is how our patient presented. So I know this is a lot, so I'm gonna walk you through it. But in general, the patient presented with multiple hypovitaminosis. She had a low vitamin A, low vitamin B1, B6. B12 was borderline low, and then we have a normal value here. I'll explain that in a second. And then vitamin D as well was low. So with the vitamin B12, the lab value that we gathered was post um, B12 supplemental therapy. So her previous local hospital, um, we gathered her records and it showed a vitamin level of about 200, which like I said, is borderline low. We consider anything under 180 to be um, deficient in B12. But still, um, it, this is a concerning value that we can add in with the uh, multiple hypovitaminosis. We also saw that you know her cholesterol was low, her prealbumin was low, glucose was high, and her hemoglobin A was 1C was also high. So this is really kind of explaining why the patient had the severe weight loss and the anorexia, but we still don't actually know exactly what's causing it, but it at least gives us a good idea of the direction we want to go. So one thing that I want to point out, though, is this optic disc pallor that we noticed on her physical examination. Does anyone know what that might have been caused by based off of the previous labs I showed you? Vitamin A deficiency? That's a great guess. So yeah, vitamin A does um, cause ophthalmologic kind of manifestations. Um, or pathologies, I should say. But in this case, this is actually vitamin B12 deficiency. So this is a, an important factor that I wanted to um, present to students because I don't necessarily think that it's always highlighted. So we typically think that vitamin B12, um, the normal range is 180 to 914-ish. Some people will go as high as 1,000. Um, but it will depend based off ho hospital standards. The one point that I want to get at is that this borderline level, which is a value and a value that is less than 300, is when you'll actually start seeing neurological manifestations of vitamin B12 deficiency. So technically, the patient could still be in normal levels of B12, but they could still have some of these manifestations in their clinical presentation. 
Once we get below 180, that's when we see those typical peripheral blood smear changes um, and the typical symptoms that we uh, would associate with vitamin B12. So just as a reminder of those um, clinical manifestations, um, we have like peripheral neuropathy, muscle weakness, and optic neuropathy, which is the thing that is actually causing that optic disc pallor. Then after we get to 180 or less, that's where we see our typical macrocytic megaloblastic anemia with accompanying fatigue or pallor, glossitis, where we have that smooth, beefy red tongue, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, loss of appetite, and weight loss. So I, I'm so glad that, um, I, I'm so sorry, I don't remember who said the vitamin A, but I think it's really important that we also remember how the ophthalmologic manifestations of vitamin deficiencies kind of present um, in patients. I'll only be focusing on the B12 and the um, B1, but it's also remember that it's also good to remember that vitamin A is a huge um, component to ophthalmologic manifestations of vitamin deficiencies as well. So for the vitamin B12, I kind of wanted to focus a little bit more on that optic neuropathy and that optic disc power. So here is an image of a normal eye. So this is a normal optic nerve. And as you can see, it's a, it has um, pretty good 3D components to it, where you can see that um, cupping um, in the back of the eye. This is an example of optic atrophy or optic disc power. The thing that I want you to most appreciate with this is that you can see that the coloration of this is less kind of yellowish orange and actually more white. And that's that pallor that we're mentioning here. You can also see that it's kind of lost it, that 3D nature to it, which is also uh, signifying the atrophy um, that you would typically see in a vitamin B12 deficient person. For vitamin B1, this is where the ophthalmoplegia comes in. So it's typically global where you'll have cranial nerves three, four, and six affected. So that ophthalmoplegia, disconjugate gaze, which will lead to your dysplopia and blurry vision. And that would be typically seen on an H test where you're testing all of the optic nerves um, to see how the movement of the eye is um, functioning. So now that we've identified the multiple hypovitaminosis that is most likely linked to her anorexia um, and massive weight loss, we need to figure out what is going on here. So does anyone know the Vindicate model for differential diagnoses? I know that typically um, for our school, we also learn the five model, but um, in this case, I'm gonna be also talking about the Vindicate model because it will be a little bit more specific to what we will be discussing in this case. So we're focusing on malnutrition and malabsorption as a cause for our patient's diagnosis. Are there any of the Vindicate model here that stand out to you as possible causes for our patient that we so far know. You feel free to put it in the chat or um, unmute yourself and have a go. You have your eye with the intoxication. Intoxication, yeah, that's a great one. We talked about how Wernicke encephalopathy can be caused by alcohol. Um, so that's a great one. Anyone else have an idea? So the ones that we are mainly focusing on would be vascular, inflammation and infection, neoplastic, deficiency, intoxication, and autoimmune. So I'll talk through each of these as to why those are the ones that we focused on the most. <laughs> 
with malnutrition and malabsorption of all nutrient components, we're thinking vascular could be a, 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 a reasonable cause as a, some type of ischemic event in the bowel area could cause um, the lack of uptake of all nutrients. That ischemic event could also be caused by some type of inflammation or infection. The patient could have some type of malignancy that is disrupting absorption of nutrients. The deficiency, obviously we have tons of deficiencies in all of her nutrient uptake. We talked about the intoxication with the Wernicke's and autoimmune kind of relates back to the inflammation as well um, as being a component of the cause of malnutrition and malabsorption. Um, I know second years have been talking a lot about autoimmune disorders, how it's disrupting B12 absorption. So um, that could also be a possibility as to one of her diagnoses for the cause of her malnutrition. So the next thing we do is um, we gathered ESR and CRP levels. So for those who don't know, ESR is erythrocyte sedimentation rate and CRP is C-reactive protein. These are markers of inflammation um, and they are helpful with our differential diagnosis. So her values were extremely high. Her ESR was 106 and her CRP was 12.2. The most important value here that I want to highlight is her ESR value. There are not many diagnoses of patients with an ESR greater than 100. So I wanna walk through with you some of those differential diagnoses. For anyone who is um, well-versed in the medical field, does anyone know one a, a few differential diagnoses for an ESR greater than 100? If not, that's okay. So typically with an ESR greater than 100, endocarditis could be a possibility, tuberculosis, different type of malignancies, including liquid neoplasms or multiple myeloma, and then vasculitis. So now that we have an ESR greater than 100 and we have our Vindicate model um, with malabsorption and malnutrition, these are the differential diagnosis, diagnoses that um, the PI came up with. And as you can see, they're kind of broken down mainly into autoimmune and inflammatory processes and malignancy. So now that we have a lot of our lab values, does any, can anyone tell me what the next step most likely would be? Promises is not a trick question. So next would be lab or our radiology, our imaging. So the imaging that we first wanted to conduct was a brain MRI. So she has a history of seizures. She also has the encephalopathy. So we wanna make sure that there's nothing that we're missing structurally or anatomically in her brain. So we decided to do an MRI and this is an axial flare T2 diffusion. And I just, if, if anyone wants to, like what stands out to you by looking at this? You don't have to have neuroendocrine yet or um, any, any, you know, background in reading radiological imaging, but I was just wondering, is there anything in particular that stands out to you in either of these images? She has some enlargement of the ventricles. Yeah. So on this image here on the right, you can see that these ventricles are what we would call ex vacuo ventricular megaly. So these uh, ventricles are greatly enlarged compared to normal. What about this image here? Does anything look wrong here? Or abnormal, I should say. Is there a little bit of shrink? It looks like there's, sorry, how do I want to phrase this? The um, structures are shrunken somewhat. Yeah, um, exactly. 
So what's interesting about this, like, that's the perfect way of describing it. It's almost like the brain looked like it shrunk a little bit. So the gyri, um, this is what we would call cortical and subcortical atrophy. Um, and the best way that we would describe this is that if you could almost fit your finger between the gyri, you see that you've lost a lot of volume of your brain. So perfectly stated, um, there was nonspecific cortical and subcortical atrophy and the ex vacuo ventricular megaly. Unfortunately, though, this does not point us to a direction of the diagnosis. It seems like more that the etiology of this is related um, to all of her symptomology as well. So next, since malignancy was also high on our list, we wanted to do a chest, abdomen, and pelvis CT. Um, but the thing is, is that it didn't show anything. Um, nonetheless, we also wanted to do a PET CT scan just to, you know, cover all of our bases for malignancy. Um, but it also is a good marker for inflammation and autoimmune diseases. So the PET CT scan is as follows. So a PET CT scan, for those who don't know, is an, a type of imaging that we use um, that helps us to visualize increased glucose uptake. And that signifies that cells are dividing rapidly. Thus why inflammatory cells, so like B cells and T cells that will divide very quickly, especially in signs of autoimmune disease or infection, as well as like cancers, um, where the cells are rapidly dividing, they're going to be lighting up. I will say that since it's glucose, the brain loves glucose. So that will always be lit up. So the only time when that would be abnormal is when you see a, a very dense area, um, a very localized and dense area that would be lit, sorry, that would light up. So um, does, other than the brain, are there any areas on this? PET CT scan that you would see kind of that yellowish light um, throughout the body. Does anyone feel comfortable pointing it out? Yeah, so the aorta and the carotid definitely have some increased uptake. So I'll start putting some arrows out. I know this is kind of hard to appreciate um, in this image, but it's a little bit increased uptake here. We also have a little bit of increased uptake in the subclavian artery, the arch of the aorta right here, you see that increased kind of yellow coloring and the abdominal aorta here. So I don't have images of the entire series of the PET scan, but throughout the entire imaging, we noticed that also the mesenteric artery was um, lit up as well in the PET scan. So based off of the PET scan, what are we thinking? Are we thinking more autoimmune inflammatory or are we thinking more malignancy based? I would tend to think more autoimmune based off those vessels than I would malignancy. I'm not aware of a lot of tumors that would spread like that. Exactly. That's great. Great point. So then on top of that, what are we thinking within this differential diagnosis? Are we thinking polymyalgia rheumatica, a vasculitis, Sjogren's syndrome, or uh, systemic lupus arithmetosis? Heading towards vasculitis. Yeah, so since the, this is mainly affecting our vessels um, or our vascular system, we're probably leaning more towards a vasculitis of some sort. So I wanted to go into a little bit of detail of vasculitis just to explain kind of like how they're um, named or what types there are. But in general, vasculitis are defined based off of the size of vessel that they affect. So we have small sized, medium-sized and large-sized vessel vasculitis. Um, now I put some asterisks here. So polyarteritis nodosa and giant cell arteritis have some asterisks. And the reason I put that there is that, you know, uh, disease processes are not perfect. So the polyarteritis nodosa is 
sometimes considered a small to medium sized vessel vasculitis and giant cell is more considered a medium to large size. So there's a little bit of um, merging between the different sizes, but in general, the ones that I have listed here only affect the small or the medium or the large size. So based off of the vessels that were affected in the PET scan, do you think that we're leaning towards small sized, medium sized, or large sized? You have some of the largest ones in the body here on the large size. Yeah. So since we're looking at the aorta, or towards large size, but we're not going to negate medium sized vessels as well. So the main ones that we're looking at here are polyarteritis nodosa, giant cell temporal arteritis, and Takayasu arteritis. <laughs> now, when we're looking at vasculitides that um, are of this nature and include giant cell arteritis, most, um, most physicians are going to conduct something called a temporal artery biopsy. Um, and so this is kind of a refresher for second years or new for first years of what the temporal artery, the course it takes. And usually what happens is that a small, um, about three centimeter biopsy is taken from the temporal artery here. Um, and I'm actually gonna show you a video. So this is a warning. Um, anyone who's a little bit uh, squeamish of blood or surgeries, I'm gonna play about a two minute video of how the temporal artery biopsy is taken. So this is just your warning. So this temporal artery biopsy was performed by the Moran Eye Center at the University of Utah. Um, so this is a video for educational purposes of how that biopsy is done. It's very um, quick. It usually takes about, or less than an hour, I would say, for each of the biopsies to be performed. And there's um, minimal risk in doing this. And it's very helpful to gain that diagnosis. So you can see here that this is the temporal artery that they're dissecting out of the fascia. And they're going to take a snippet right here and here. And this biopsy is going to go to pathology to see if we can look and see any type of um, inflammatory indication in these vessels. So now they're just, ooh. Tying off the vessels and then they'll stitch it back up. And that is typically the process of it. So it's pretty short, which is great. Um, and it's highly useful in diagnosing arteritis um, like this. Okay, so I'm gonna move on. So this is what the biopsy looked like. Um, so I've put some arrows around an area um, of this biopsy. Can anyone tell me what this is? So it's usually an inflammatory process. We can see it in many autoimmune diseases, sometimes infections. Is this a non-casating granuloma? Exactly. So this is a perfect example of a granuloma. Um, and if I could have increased the magnification, you would also see um, giant cells as well in there. So... In the end, the patient had giant cell arteritis. And so some information about it is that it's the most common uh, systemic granulomatous vasculitity um, in individuals over the age of 50. It typically affects large and medium-sized vessels, typically the temporal artery and the carotid arteries. The presentation is headache, visual disturbances, jaw claudication, and polymyalgia rheumatica.
but as in this case, 40% uh, will present with an atypical manifestation. But the presence of multinucleated giant cells and granulomas in the temporal artery is diagnostic in determining this um, as your cause or your etiology. So this patient was then put on systemic glucocorticoid steroids until her symptoms were manageable. And then she was trans transitioned off the steroids and onto a, mono sorry, a monoclonal antibody therapy. What's incredible is that in follow-up, she's nearly returned to baseline. So from going from encephalopathic to baseline is um, usually kind of unheard of, especially when something presents as insidiously as this did. The only thing that they did notice is that she had some enterograde amnesia due to the chronic thiamine deficiency. So if you remember in the case presentation, um, she was having these symptoms for over six weeks. So we did have some consequences due to the hypovitaminosis, but it was not as bad as it could have been, especially now that she's on treatment. So my take home points are that the prolonged workup is what really led to the connecting the malnutrition and the hypovitaminosis to giant cell. In addition, knowing your foundational science concepts, knowing what each vitamin deficiency causes really helps to understand her clinical presentation. This also um, sets a precedence to trying to find out um, whether SMA involvement or superior mesenteric artery involvement um, could be the mechanism behind the symptom of anorexia in giant cell arteritis patients. So with that, I would just like to acknowledge my PI, Dr. David Roman Renner. Um, he was instrumental in helping me um, go through the case study um, and presenting the material to others. Um, I would like to thank the following for their suggestions and help as well, and the Moran Eye Center for conducting the biopsy. Here are my references. And if anyone has any questions, please feel free. Awesome. Thank you so much, student Dr. Shapiro. Um, that was a great presentation. Great job. Thank you, everybody. Um, for participating today, for showing up. Um, as she was saying, if anybody has any questions, feel free to raise your hand in Zoom or use the chat if maybe you can't unmute and talk. Uh, Dr. Schrodinger? So, yeah, that was a great presentation. Particularly enjoyed the part where you took out the uh, a little chunk of where you showed the video taking out the, a chunk of artery, and that's where my question is. Yeah. Um, taking out a chunk of artery like that, it seems like you cut off blood supply to, you know, is, is there any manifestation post biopsy for the patient in doing that? Yeah, that's a great question. So in general, because there's such great collateral blood supplies, um, most patients will not have any significant side effects by kind of almost ligating that artery. Um, however, that doesn't mean that there is zero risk in doing this biopsy, but um, it is important that this biopsy is conducted so that they can be on the appropriate treatment. So most individuals will undergo the risk, um, especially since it, it for the outcomes, um, most people don't um, complain too much about any severe symptoms of having that um, that artery kind of cut off. Um, but it is a really important thing that we mentioned to patients that it is a possibility that you could have some side effects due to this procedure. Is that why you, one chooses to do it on that artery? Because it, it should show manifestations of Correct. the diagnosis it and, is, it would, it, and it wouldn't you know, I mean, you can't take a chunk of your aorta out. <laughs> exactly, yes. And so um, we, we choose the temporal artery because it is the lowest risk artery to take a biopsy from because right. exactly, as you said, we can't, we can't biopsy the carotids. We can't biopsy the, the you know, the aorta. 
Um, and that's kind of one of the limitations to identifying superior mesenteric artery involvement um, in these patients. And it all has to be done through clinical presentation. That's crazy. Good job. Thank you so much. Any other questions, comments? Um, if not, thank you so much again, Sue Dr. Shapiro. Great presentation. Um, and thank you everybody for being here. Um, I appreciate very much your style of presentation. In other words, mm -hmm. it, was, um, it was kind of a nice case study and, and the question and answer stuff was, was really good. I appreciate your approach. Student Dr. Shapiro, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I agree 100%. Um, thanks again, everyone. Happy Friday. <laughs>